Um, my name is Ann Merchant, and we want to welcome all of you here today for our event, Art and Gadgetry, Sparking Creativity. And we are, of course, featuring the CEO and founder of Spark Fund. So we're extremely excited to have Nathan Seidel with us here today. And so that's going to be great. And of of course, I am, as always, joined by, and of course, I should mention that Rick is technically on vacation this week, and so mm -hmm. oh, it's a big deal that you're here. Well, yes, uh, not, uh, always, no, I, I would always uh, join for this. The, um, there's no vacation from these events. But well, I wouldn't want to be left here to do this by myself, so thank you. <laughs> I wouldn't leave you hanging, Anne. I am uh, Rick Lovard. I'm the program director of the Science and Entertainment Exchange, a program of the National Academy of Sciences. And so we're going to get to it, but as always, we want to make you aware of a few things that are going on here at the National Academy of Sciences. The first of which is that the, um, the membership of the President's Council of Advis Advisors on Science and Technology um, that's out of the White House. House has been announced. That's what PCAST is what we call it. And the first of all, the chair of PCAST, Eric Lander, is a member of both the National Academy of Sciences and the National Academy of Medicine. Um, his two vice chairs, Frances Arnold, is a member of all three of our academies. We like to call her a triple threat, and she's been on our stage a number of times. And also Maria Zuber, who is a member of the National Academy of Sciences. In fact, I believe half of the council is composed, more than half, of members of one of our academies. So it was a big day here for us at the National Academy of Sciences, and of course, a big day for science to have such a diverse and really interesting group of people named by President Biden to form his PCAST Council. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that we have also um, released the, there's a new video that's come out from Hispanic and Latinx members of the National Academy of Medicine, urging members of their community to be vaccinated against the COVID-19 virus. So I think that that's something that's really important and we're happy to see that come out. And the other thing that's coming out that's a little bit related to today's event, we have a report coming out tomorrow. The public announcement is tomorrow and it's called, I have to read this, Developing a Toolkit for Fostering Open Science Practices. So it's a way essentially to strengthen the rigor and the reliability of science by having um, open source science that is practiced at large research institutions. Um, so of course, Sachi has been putting the links in the chat so that you can find those things for yourself. But we know that not everybody is going to read the source material, take that deep dive at the National Academy of Sciences. So that's why the Science and Entertainment Exchange exists. Rick? Yeah, so if you are a writer, producer, uh, director, actor, storyteller in any format of mass media and you have a question about science, you can call us and we will connect you with somebody who knows what they're talking about to answer your questions as they relate to story. And, uh, you know, we opened our doors uh, over 13 years ago and we have done over 3,300 consults, including, uh, I think, every Marvel film since Iron Man 2. So, um, Please, if you are a STEM professional and you're just hearing about this work that we do, bringing scientists and engineers and medical professionals together with uh, writers and producers, uh, please uh, put up your hand and let us know uh, that you're interested in doing these kinds of consoles. We're always looking for new people. Um, I want to thank a couple of people or a couple of organizations in particular, Howard Hughes Medical Institute, who finances these events in particular. This would not be happening without uh, their generous support. So thank you. We also get major funding from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation and many individual donors like you. I want to thank everybody who joined at our supporter level today. You uh, should have gotten a link to access to a VIP q and I will tell you more about that, but you will now be in all the VIP Q&As because you are now a VIP, so thank you. Um, I want to thank Courtney, Sachi, Jeff, and Ameche for all the support and work that you do on the back end. We could not do these events without you guys, uh, believe me. Um, and so today, it's going to be a really simple structure. We're going to have in a moment Nathan, who Ann will tell you more about in a second, and he's going to speak for, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes, something like that. I don't know. And then all the slides jump, run out. Yeah. I'll jump in. <laughs> if at any point during Nathan's talk, you have a question or while once I jump on and uh, put my ugly mug on screen, um, 
If at any point you have a question, please ask it either down here or up here in the Q&A. And I will be the voice of the audience trying to get as many questions as possible. We always have more questions than we have time for. Um, and that brings us to the VIP Q&A. Some of you signed up for that in particular, or if you are a supporter or one of our retreat alums, you should have gotten the link. If you did not, you please contact Sachi. Um, and then those folks can uh, ask questions directly on video uh, for about a half hour after the event. Um, I think that is all that we have for, oh wait, oh, did I missed something in? I am on- Your vacation. rabbit hole. No, well, my no, rabbit you're... hole for the week. Yes, my rabbit hole for the, for this week, the thing that uh, got my attention as I was researching this event is Wired Magazine's list of the biggest tech bombs of the 2010s. So uh, Nathan, uh, in, our, in, our, uh, in our prep calls, was talking about the fact that uh, they, sort of, they sort of admire failure. I'll let him get into all of that uh, as a learning tool. Um, and so this article caught my attention. And Anne? Cool. Yeah. So my rabbit hole is the Center for Bits and Atoms at MIT. And uh, Neil Gershenfeld, who is, of course, a good friend to the exchange, runs that center and has done that for quite some time. And so it's a really interesting place. Um, it, it sort of operates operates at the intersection of the biological sciences and the physical sciences. And as they like to say, that they turn data into things and things into data. And they've been hosting conversations, um, interspecies internet conversations. So, okay, Neil, you win. We, I mean, I think I talked about zebras at our last event, but we have no zebras on our stage. We're not interspecies. So uh, yeah, pretty awesome. Not yet. No, not different. yet. But of course, wh who we do have is Nathan. And I think the rabbit hole is well connected because we found Nathan. Rick and I are always talent hunting. We were on a panel that uh, the Center for Bits and Atoms, the Fab Lab hosted um, as part of Fab 16. And Nathan was part of our panel. And we listened to his talk and we thought, that's really interesting. That guy's cool. We have to get him on our stage um, and reached out to, to Neil and asked for his contact information. So, so Nathan, we're going to ask you to come on and, and first tell us, of course, about your background before we let you go, because we're all like, that's an awesome virtual background, but it's, it's not, right? Don't, for, don't forget to unmute and thank you for answering our cold call. Absolutely. So uh, what you see behind me is a wall of printed circuit boards. Um, this is sort of uh, the smartphone offices. You may see folks walking by, but um, this wall is all of our uh, uh, mistake PCBs, the printed circuit boards that we messed up. We really like to put on the wall so that we can see and learn from our mistakes. We try to wear Fantastic. it on the wall, literally, so that we can see it. That's so great. Well, we're looking forward to your talk. We're going to turn it over to you, and Rick and I are going to disappear. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. We're going to share the screen. Um, so I uh, wanted to share the when Rick and Ann asked me to talk. This was a really fun talk to put together because um, I have never talked about some of this stuff. Um, so you're getting some of the the fun, weird uh, origination stories of my life and SparkFun. When if you ever talked to my wife, uh, if you asked my wife to describe me, she would. Uh, one of the words she would say is, you know, he's always had a knack for business. And I didn't believe her. I was like, no, this is just a sparkling thing. She's like, no, no, you've been at it since you were a kid. And so I went digging. And you're lucky today. This is a, a, a school project from my fifth grade class. That's me. Um, uh, and in this project, um, I guess I was required to put together some sort of family crest. I don't even know, but you can see, like, I was into computers then and I was into puzzles. I'm still to this day really into mechanical puzzles and, and computers, but it, I guess my fam, I was into crows. I, I have no idea, but um, my life was held together with twist ties. Uh, that's sort of my, um, you know, upbringing and family. But the thing that did not make it into the school project, the end of fifth grade, I decided to go out with sort of a bang. And I said, you know what, I kind of want to shave my head. And I, in my weird fifth grade head, I was like, oh, cool. I'll go to my friends and ask them to each pay me $5 to shave my head. I, I don't know what I was thinking, but I went and I got seven of my friends to agree to pay me $5. A few weird things about this. First of all, it's a contract. Second of all, it's not in my handwriting. 
I can't remember who wrote this up. It must have been one of my friends that was like looking out for me. Uh, but the other fun thing about this is there's no like, it's not a bet. I don't, there's no downside to me. I don't have to pay my friends if I don't shave my head. Uh, one other thing, and I showed this to my dad and he was blown away. He was like, yeah, I remember this. The other thing I remember is that you only made 30 bucks. I was like, that's weird. There's seven people on here. He's like, yeah, one of them didn't pay. So he even today, he remembers that I got shorted by one of my friends. But uh, even in the fifth grade, I was I was doing weird stuff, shaved my head, got 30 bucks and started out the summer pretty well. So I've always uh, I don't know if I I've always been interested in like electronics or, or money specifically, but it, I always had this weird sort of business sense uh, in the back of my nerd brain. Fast forward a year, my brother and sister were playing a lot of soccer. So I found myself at the soccer fields all the time and I was digging through the, the bins, pulling out all the aluminum cans. And I had my dad take me to the, the uh, metal yard where you could recycle this stuff. And I remember I had a bag and a half of recycled cans and I got 20 bucks. I was like, oh, this is fantastic. And so I was like, oh, let's keep doing this. So over the next three or four months, I collected even more cans and we went and I got like three bucks the price of aluminum had collapsed. And so I was like, oh, what am I gonna do with all the cans I've collected? And so I convinced my father to allow me to store bags of aluminum cans in my parents' attic for, it must've been like 10 years until they moved out. I was playing the, the spot price of aluminum on the commodities market at the age of, I don't know what, 12, uh, maybe even younger than that. But again, it was like, oh, well, they're not, you, they're not uh, uh, very valuable today. Maybe they'll be valuable tomorrow. And I did a bit of hoarding. Um, this is about sixth or seventh grade. Uh, in the mid-90s, the way that you uh, talked online, there was no online, but there was bulletin board systems. So I ran my own bulletin board system on one phone line out of my family's house. So I would, I would tell my brother and sister to get off the phone, and then I'd have a friend call in, and our computers would communicate. And this game, Legend of the Red Dragon, was a really popular game. And I, you know, I'm the guy that ran the bulletin board, so I was the systems administrator. I really liked it because it was turns-based, and you could control how many turns each player had. And so I decided that I would try to charge my, it was a fun game, if you want more turns, pay me two bucks a month and you can have more turns. I think I got one friend to pay me and I remember it because he paid me in uh, Centennial Quarters, which is kind of weird, but I think he, he like rated his parents stash of like collector coins or something, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, but even in the mid nineties, um, we were trying to communicate. We were trying to use phone lines, bulletin board systems before the internet to communicate. On those bulletin board systems, these files would get traded some of them were uh, these computer, uh, uh, sorry, calculator games. If you went through school at a certain time, you had a TI calculator. And these TI calculators could do, you know, you could graph and you could draw pictures and you could do fun stuff, but the really, everybody wanted to be playing games. How did you get games? Well, you had to connect a cable in between calculators. It was the original sneaker net. It was the way that you passed programs and information that you had to walk around. You had to use your sneakers and, and plug cables into each other's calculators and share that stuff. And it, it worked. It was okay. But if, there, if a certain school didn't have a certain game, there was no way to introduce it. And so while I ran the bulletin board system, there was these schematics that kept popping up. And these are a, a TI calculator to printer port schematic. So back in the day, printer ports were these 25 pin jobs on the back. And you could, um, I, so I went to Radio Shack and I bought some parts. And uh, again, in seventh grade, I think I was, I was trying to teach myself how to solder and put this stuff together. And I cannot tell you how exciting it was the first time I soldered this thing together and I got it working. I was like, oh my goodness, this electronics thing is pretty neat. I was pretty hooked, but I then proceeded to build these for all my friends at school and charging them whatever it was, 30 or 40 bucks per uh, calculator cable so that they could share games, pull games off the bulletin board system. It was also really handy for like writing up notes and then transferring notes to your calculator so you could you know, have an advantage on a desk, but that, that's an aside. Um, so then uh, enter the, the sort of mid to late 90s, American Online is like, raging and uh, having all sorts of fun. So me and my friends are jumping on and finding all sorts of ways to get on American Online. Um, can you imagine today what it would be like if you had to pay for internet access by the hour? That's what it was like. 
American Online, you had a certain number of hours every month. And if you went over that, they charged you through the nose. And so originally it was, you know, 250 hours. This was 500 hours. Anyways, it's just blast from the past. But we jump on American Online, not because it's the internet, because, but because it was sort of the first way that we could communicate with your files. In ninth grade, I had uh, saved up enough money the previous summer roofing um, in Kansas of all places. Super hot job, made you really appreciate uh, a desk job. But I saved up enough money roofing uh, that I bought, this is a CD recorder. In 1996, this was the first sub $1,000 CD recorder and it was huge. It totally changed the market. Uh, I was the first kid in Tulsa, possibly the first kid in Oklahoma to have one of these things. What it allowed you to do was copy audio CDs or copy data CDs at 1x. It was terrible. It took 60 minutes to copy a 60 minute audio CD or approximately that long to copy a, a, a software CD. And the, the blank CDs were super expensive. They were, you had to buy five and they were eight bucks a piece. And this thing would eat CDs like crazy. It, I, was, I was lucky if I could get it uh, in two tries. So what I had was a CD recorder and it was great. I could, you know, do all sorts of fun stuff with it. My friends would come to me and they're like, oh my goodness, please, here's a blank CD. Here's some sort of program. Here's 10 bucks, please copy it for me. So in the ninth grade, I was running a very brisk business of um, copying all sorts of stuff. And uh, I should have checked the statutes of limitations before the stock, but I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm in the clear. Um, so uh, $1,000 in 1996 is now, you know, almost basically gone because the internet, but it was a really big deal in ninth grade. Fast forward a couple of years to, um, I went to a very interesting uh, school called the Oklahoma School of Science and Mathematics. It's a boarding school for 11th and 12th graders. Uh, it's affectionately called Nerd Jail. So it's Nerd Jail because um, they, you're living in, effectively, it's a dorm, you're living on campus and you're there and you're minors. And so this picture doesn't show it, but there's an eight foot wrought iron fence around whatever this is, three or four acres to prevent people from getting in, but also so the students couldn't get out. You checked in, they locked you in and you were there. This was awesome because they took these schools, there's a couple of dozen of them across North America. And what they do is they say, you know what, to cover the state in academic, advanced academics, we can't do. So in rural Oklahoma, if you are you know, needing calculus and your local school doesn't provide it, you apply to this high school and if you get in, then you get, uh, man, I learned calculus and advanced physics. It was great. The other thing that they provided in 1998 was broadband optic fiber internet. So this is like the first time we're having internet. Some of these kids had never had it and it's on all the time. And they are on chatting and playing StarCraft until two or three in the morning. It was so much fun. Some of them flamed out, but most of us made it through. Now, one of the challenges, uh, well, the other fun thing about uh, the late 90s was the start of, well, one, the internet, and two, the start of the dot-com boom. And if you weren't there in 1998, the internet was pixelated and it was, it looked terrible and it was fantastic. It was a free-for-all of human expression and all sorts of fun stuff. But in addition to that, there was this little company called All Advantage. And All Advantage would say, look, you have to install this ad bar that takes up whatever, a fifth of your screen. Um, but for every hour that you surf the internet and have to stare at our terrible advertisements, we will pay you 25 cents. We'll pay you a quarter. Well, if you are you know, somebody in industry, who cares? But if you're in high school and you've got an always on internet connection, this is free money. And so we uh, jumped on this. All of my friends and I said, you know what? We can, we can totally do this and you can make some additional money by referring your friends. And so I, I brought, you know, my, the friends referred me and it was great and uh, uh, we were making money and there's no, um, you know, I don't learn things until I'm really pushed to. And so one of the things I was sitting in class trying to calculate how to maximize profit from this all advantage thing. And I realized that if I referred myself a bunch of times then I could maximize my profit. So I figured out how to create multiple accounts. One of the challenges was you couldn't do Nathan Seidel, Nathan Seidel. It had to be Nathan A Seidel, Nathan B Seidel, Nathan C Seidel. There's a few problems with this. One, uh, I have to sleep. 
Okay, so these accounts have a maximum of 25 hours a month. So you can surf the internet and do all this stuff, but eventually you have to like sleep. And so I decided to buy a computer, a used computer that just ran all advantage on it and would have some macro. So move the mouse and click around and act like it was surfing the internet. Uh, all the while, all advantage is sort of racking up time. And at midnight every night, it would switch to the next account. So it would go to Nathan G. Seidel or Nathan F. Seidel, whichever direction it was going. Uh, so this worked great, except that I started getting checks in the mail for like 20 and 30 bucks, but across like, you know, 20 or 30 accounts uh, to the dorms. And so the folks in the dorms are like, Nathan, what are you doing? I was like, oh, it's no big, it's fine, no worries. And so then uh, at the ripe old age of 16, I went and opened up my own PO box so that I could send checks there instead of my high school. Uh, and this went on for a couple months and it was all, it was gravy, right? Um, the challenge, however, uh, is that um, Nerd Jail sends you home every three or four weeks. They, they force you to go home and visit your parents and have a nice meal before, you know, you have, you have a long weekend and then you come back. So I, I came back after this long weekend and I walk into the school, I'm checking in and they're like, oh, Nathan, good to see you again. You need to go see the dean. Uh, oh, oh, okay. Uh, so I go see the dean. Now, little side uh, story, the nerd jail was very good, very smart people. Um, they had sort of an issue though. There was a couple students, uh, was not me, that um, happened to be hacking into some naval military servers. And so when I went to talk to the Dean, uh, the Dean's like, okay, Nathan, we were doing some maintenance on the network over the weekend and we saw some activity on your specific port. So we, we keyed into you and your roommate's room and his computer was off and your computer was off. So we went back to the wiring closet and there's still activity there. So we went back into your room and look, start looking around, the, the computer's off. And then we look behind your desk and there's this computer back there that's running that has no keyboard and no monitor. Uh, so uh, what you doing? So I had to explain to the dean, how, how do you explain to the dean? It's like, no, 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 I'm not hacking into any military service. I'm just, you know, small, like, check fraud. It's no big deal. So anyways, um, yeah, they uh, kicked me off of all computers in the high school. They disconnected my internet, and uh, I damn near got kicked out of high school. Um, but luckily, uh, uh, made it through the... Um, the, the kind of subcaption for this talk is um, white boys get away with everything. I fully acknowledge that, um, that I did some very bad stuff back in the day and my privilege and everything else, I'm very, very lucky. And I, I really towed the line on a lot of things here, um, but it is sort of the, the origin story. And so I, I luckily graduated from high school and uh, got into the University of Colorado at Boulder to study electrical engineering. And two years in, sophomore year, I'm, I'm sitting in this bedroom up here. This house had like three floors and 15 people living in it. It was terrible, uh, but me and my two roommates had the, the top floor. So in this bedroom, um, I start building stuff, electronics, I'm, I'm hooked, right? And this is a picture of my desk. Uh, that's a little microcontroller. That's a little piece of memory. Um, that is a GPS receiver. In 2002, this is a GPS data logger. Uh, Cool, fine. I'm, I'm like, I'm hooked on my hobby and having fun. Uh, this programmer is, uh, I was moving it around, set it on a bit of wire. There was a, a spark and a bit of smoke uh, and destroyed the, 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 uh, the, the tool, but it started um, Spark from Electronics. So this is the company because of that error, because of that spark and that I was right there having tons of fun, um, started a company. And I've been uh, uh, working at Spark Fund for the last 18 years. We have about 100 employees. We manufacture stuff. We post it on our website. We do all sorts of silly videos to show how you can use it. And we ship stuff all over the world. Uh, seven continents and counting. Um, we've shipped to the research base in, is it McMurdo? In uh, the Antarctic. Um, so keep going. Um, after running Spark Fund for 13 years, I said, you know what, uh, I am tired of business. I'm really into electronics, but I am tired of this business stuff. So I stepped down as CEO, hired a new CEO, and Glenn is doing a great job. My job now for the last five years at Spark Fund is just to do R&D. So I have a group called SparkX, just does crazy stuff. Um, so picture of a safe. My wife, for Christmas, uh, three or four years ago, hands me a safe. It's 55 pounds. She sort of slides it across the floor. And she says, Nathan, um, I found this on Craigslist. It was 20 bucks because they lost the combination. Have fun. And I was in love. My wife is amazing. Um, I love puzzles, right? I love um, playing with locks and all sorts of stuff. So my uh, uh, co-workers and I figured out a couple vulnerabilities on how to open up the safe. We then built a robot. Um, it's got an Arduino, it's got a motor, it's got a handle puller, all this junk. Um, 
it, what, what, it ha what it does is it takes the million combinations and reduces that to about a thousand so that you can open a safe within about 40 minutes. So we, uh, we, so we published it. We were like, hey, it's all over the internet. Um, we did a video, it got, it got picked up big. We then published uh, or applied for a talk at DEF CON. DEF CON is the biggest hacker conference in the world. Uh, it takes place every year in Vegas. And I was like, okay, we're gonna give a 45 minute talk. We're gonna have a, uh, a safe on stage. And we're gonna do this live in front of everybody. Worst idea of my life, uh, it ended pretty well, but um, it's kind of fun stuff. The robot is pretty small and, and transportable, but you can't fly with a safe. So what do you do? We flew into Vegas. Um, we took it over to Home Depot or whatever. Um, then three guys buy a safe. We then get another Uber back to the casino. I can't imagine what the Uber driver was thinking. Like three guys taking a safe to a casino? What the hell? But uh, we got it on, on stage. We hooked up the robot. We pressed the go button and I started my talk. And very, I started my talk very confident. I made it through, I think it was like 37 minutes of my talk. I was on the next dial slide sweating bullets hoping that the safe would open and at the last minute doo -doo -doo, the robot opened the safe all hell broke loose and i never finished my talk because people were so up in arms uh we got really really lucky and uh got uh, a safe that we had never opened before uh opened with a robot so that is sort of my origin story as it were um kind of what i do on a day-to-day -day basis and then i wanted to uh leave you with a few sort of um thoughts about the future and where i think um this not necessarily this world may be going um but where i i think some interesting things are going um what is this if you said snuggy you'd be wrong because this is a slanket a slanket is a knockoff snuggy so even bad ideas are copied. So uh, in the future, I believe intellectual property and trademark is going to be way less valuable. And hear me out, um, the, the number of uh, innovators and the number of manufacturers and the speed at which things are changing dictates that patents really don't apply anymore. So um, a patent takes three to five years, 30 to $50,000 just to get a decision. And then you have a, a monopoly for uh, 17 years. But if you think about how much did your cell phone change in the last three years, it changed at a tremendous rate. So as we, as people try to patent things, I remember I bought something on Amazon and then I went back a couple months later to buy it again and there was a patent and so that product was no longer available. What did I do? I went on eBay and bought the same thing, right? You can play whack-a-mole as much as you want with intellectual property, but it's that it's exactly that. It's whack-a-mole. Are if you have a patent, are you going to trust the U.S. Customs and Border Patrol to correctly identify that little package? No. If you're a customer and you want a thing, whether it's a slanket, a snuggie, or or some you know running thing that I was looking for, um, do you care where you have to get it? I'll go. I'll go buy it off Taobao. I'll go buy it off of eBay, right? I'll, I'm a consumer. I will figure out how to get it. Um, I think uh, trademark and patent law is is fine. I think it'll be around in 20 years. But um, at SparkFun, all of these things, all of these products, all 500 of the things we design and build in our house are open source. We don't patent anything. We say, you know what, bring it on, copy what I'm doing, because I know you're going to do it anyways. And so uh, we are trying to innovate. It forces us to innovate as quickly as possible. So I think um, the world is going to see a lot more uh, innovation, a lot faster, with uh, a lot less time worrying about or getting patents, because they, they don't really help. The next sort of little weird thing that I think the, the future uh, is ripe for, um, this is what's called high precision GPS. And when it's all hooked up and going, um, it will give you half an inch or approximately 14 millimeters of XYZ precision. Okay, so to, get, to put that in perspective, your cell phone knows about two meters or six or seven feet where you are. So it knows what street you're on. It knows that you're probably on the sidewalk, uh, but that's about it. So this product, this technology, has been around for the last 10 or 15 years, but it was 10 or $15,000. Only a lot in the last six months has this technology dropped below the $1,000 price point. This is now about $500. Now remember that CD recorder, that was about $1,000 that just broke loose a logjam of all sorts of innovation. 
I'm, I, so we're here, we're similarly with high precision GPS. Now, I don't think this is gonna be the panopticon of asset tracking, like not everybody needs to know where their cat is down to half an inch, but it opens up all sorts of weird applications. Um, just to name a few, uh, glacier tracking is a really big thing for this product right now. They're putting multiple units on hillsides to detect um, movement of the hillside so that you can predict mudslides. You can also get some really accurate timing. Um, some folks may be familiar with, uh, oh, I forget the program, but um, you can basically uh, triangulate uh, poachers shooting elephants. So if you have really accurate clocks and you have microphones and you say, hey, I heard a, a shot, I heard the shot, I heard the shot, you can triangulate where the shot was fired using these high precision devices. So there's a lot of really interesting applications coming and we're just sort of, uh, uh, you know, there at the onset providing the technology, but we're pretty excited to see um, what customers use for it. I think it's really gonna become part of the zeitgeist over the next 10 or 20 years. Uh, last slide, I swear. And um, the number one lesson I've learned about running business and doing engineering, um, you know stuff, right? You know some shit. And you went to college to learn that stuff. And while in college, and maybe a little after college, you learned that you didn't know some stuff. I don't know accounting, right? I don't know Italian. There's things that I don't know. But the longer I live and the more projects I do and the longer, the more businessy things I do, it's the shit that you don't know you don't know that stings, right? It's when some curveball pops up out of nowhere uh, that it, it really hurts. So I... Uh, the, the older I get, the more I realize humanity needs a dose of uh, humility. We need to realize that we can't know everything and that we need to depend on each other for sort of that um, uh, mutual network. So uh, that's, um, yeah, I hope that the, the future of humanity really kind of slows down and uh, realizes that there's a lot of things we, can, we won't all know and that we uh, need to depend on each other to do. All right, that was awesome. That was... Uh... And that you covered a lot, you covered a lot there. Um, so um, Wes and Amira asked a very similar question. So I'm gonna start with that. Like, what is your line between sort of theft, fraud and creativity and sort of new, new innovation? Um, so uh, I don't know that I don't know the line between theft, fraud, and creativity, but I do know that it, it, there's something in some people's DNA that likes to pull at the edges, right? It's like, ooh, how do I create a second account? How do I unlock that safe? How do I, and, and the line between creativity and, uh, you know, trying to get a safe open, that is totally blurred. That is so much fun to use all of your brain power to try to figure out and be really creative um, about trying to get into a place you're not supposed to be. So, you know, here in the U.S., uh, there's, there's sort of a, a premium on the idea of intellectual property. Um, but are we all living in the bubble? Like, are, are we an outlier? Uh, not currently. Again, this is kind of future state. This is 20, 10 or 20 years down the road. Um, now, there's lots of other countries with lots of other intellectual property laws. Um, it's just the speed at which we can innovate and ship across the world is really dictating uh, the, it's the consumer is dictating that growth. And, um, you know, I think the consumer is really the one driving the want for less intellectual property. Hmm. So I want to remind everybody in the audience, you can ask questions in the Q and a, but as we're, as we're also uh, looking at that idea, you know, there are a fair number of people in our audience who are storytellers. And so their property is the ideas that they've had about character and story. So have you given any thought uh, to how this applies, not just to consumer products or circuit boards, but also to story and, and character. Ooh, I don't know. Give me an example. Well, just, you know, if, if somebody, if somebody just took Mickey Mouse and made a Mickey Mouse movie, uh, you know, it based in some other country, uh, having nothing to do with Disney, you know, are you, when you talk about the speed of innovation and all this kind of stuff, do you think it applies or do you think that's a different class? <sighs> That, um, that gets into a particular of uh, trademark law where, uh, what is it, Steamboat Willie? Has that yeah. entered the public domain yet? Uh, I think Disney has magically not entered Mickey Mouse or Steamboat Willie into the public domain. Yeah. I don't know how they do that. But, uh, you know, the, I, I know that there's tremendous pressure and, and um, 
whatever money against this idea of changing trademark and intellectual property law. Um, but there's, it, I'm betting on the, the innovators. I'm betting on the creative folks that are going to create all sorts of derivatives and um, interesting recombinations of things that either skirt or directly flaunt those laws because um, folks want to be creative. Folks want to design and build and create art that other people want to enjoy. And um, I don't know, I guess I'm of the camp that is uh, ask for forgiveness rather than permission. Again, I realized how privileged that sounds and it totally is, um, but it, it, I think there's something to be said about uh, being less cautious when uh, it's deemed necessary. Um, so I, I'm gonna, uh, forgive me if I'm mispronouncing this name. It looks like Adi Banjo Oriad uh, is asking, what is the educational level use uh, for Spark Fund uh, products? What, what level of education do people use it most often? Oh, I have a great story. Okay, so, um, you know, I, I, I thought I was going to be selling to other university students. I thought I was be like, hey, here's this programmer, here's this microcontroller development board, yay. Um, and so for a decade, we put something called the beerware license on everything we did. Beerware says that, you know, you can use this code, you can use this, this design, and if we ever meet, at, you know, at a conference somewhere, you buy me a beer. Okay, it's been around for a long time, and I've gotten dozens of beers out of it. It's been wonderful. However, um, we had an event at SparkFun and, you know, I'm sort of going through the crowds and this little boy comes up and he's like, oh, hey, are you Nathan Seidel? He's like, oh, yeah. He, and he pulls out a beer and he hands me a beer. And I'm like, where is your mother? What is going on? Why are you handing me this? And he's like, oh, I just wanted to thank you for that, uh, the MIDI control sketch that you wrote demonstrating how to play musical instruments on this one piece of hardware. I used that code in one of my student projects. And I was just like, whoa. So it showed, you know, I thought I was helping and aiming at university and professionals above, but really SparkFund products have worked their way into, you know, down into the middle school curriculum. So to answer this person's question, um, our products can be used at kind of any level. Um, I've taught five-year-olds how to solder. Um, they're actually a lot better at it than adults because when they burn their finger, they go, ow, and they lick their finger and they keep soldering where adults get scared. Um, so, you know, it's all over the board, but I'd say the, the target audience for SparkFun products and education is really at that high school, college level. Gotcha. Um, so Tim is asking, how does the lack of intellectual property protection work for projects that require large investments? And then he says, uh, it's one thing if someone copies your slanket, it's another if they copy your quantum computer designs. Um, so it applies at all levels. So uh, we often, in the open source community, we often get the pushback like, you know, this is great, but it can't apply to pharmaceuticals because it, it costs so much money to do this, that, and the other. Um, my argument on the flip side of that is, um, there's always opportunities for efficiencies. There's always ways to decrease uh, uh, expenses, um, but the pharmaceutical companies, when given a patent on a multi-billion dollar contract with the government, um, are, are, they're not going to spend money wisely. Um, so I've got products that I'm working on that we are uh, probably a couple million dollars invested into those products. And when they go live, they go live. You'll have all the design files, you'll have all the firmware, you'll have everything. It is the nature of how you set up your business. So uh, at SparkFun, um, you know, I have challenges of, uh, I've got to ship the thing to the customer at a good price. Um, I have to provide support. Um, what else, you know, that there's, uh, have to have high quality product. Those are business problems. Those have nothing to do with intellectual property. Even if I had a patent, I would still have to deal with those. So we differentiate ourselves by providing really good product, really blah, 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 blah. So um, to answer your question, I don't think there's a limit to the complexity of a product being open source. Um, so Garth, I think, has a good follow on to this, which is he wants to know what SparkFun's business model is if everything you do is open source. Ah, okay. So I will sell, I wish I had a thing. I have a thing. Okay. So I'll sell you one of these things for 20 bucks and you can buy the same thing on Amazon or eBay or Alibaba for 10 bucks. Why would you spend 20 bucks at SparkFun? Because my customers make a certain amount per hour. And when you get my product, you'll have the documentation and you'll have you'll know that it's been tested and you'll have that thing humming in 10 minutes. When you buy the same product from somebody else, you're gonna spend an hour or two or a day trying to make that product work. So in the end, we have, uh, we're a lot cheaper and we're a lot more valuable. 
Gotcha. So um, Lawrence wants to know, uh, are you, do, are you, do you differentiate, I think, between uh, hardware and software? I, I mean, are you guys just putting out the software? Or are you uh, also putting out hard, hardware? Lawrence, please ask that question a different way if uh, I got it wrong there. Okay, uh, so, so uh, Sparkfin is predominantly a hardware company. We sell atoms. We sell physical things that you get. Um, we also have to write a lot of documentation, but also a lot of um, what's called firmware, which is the software that kind of makes those products work. Okay, um, so uh, Ruby wants to know what are some ideas or trends that you don't want to miss out on? I, I don't know. Oh, it's it's like mundane technical stuff like NBIOT and cellular stuff. No, it's all boring. Um, I don't know. That's a good question. Uh, well, oh, go ahead. Well, I was gonna say we can come back to it, but if you got it, go for it. Uh, so what I've learned is that um, I am I am old, and old dogs don't learn new tricks. And so it's it's you know I have interns that come through uh, SparkFun and the 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 young kids that come in they're you know freshman sophomore college they teach me a phenomenal amount so the trends that I don't want to miss out on I have to find a way to keep in touch with um, the the new the new tool sets um, so I don't I, Wendy I don't have a good answer for you but it's um, the way that we try to stay abreast of interesting new trends is by talking to those those younger engineers. Uh, speaking of young people, Irvin is a high school teacher from the Philippines and wants to know how to develop creativity and curiosity in kids and teens, in your opinion. Man, great question. Um, I, I can, I, the only answer I have is my own. Um, the way that I got really innovative was uh, uh, sparking curiosity, was taking stuff apart. Um, I remember um, a weed eater. So weed eater is a thing you plug into the wall and you, you pull the button and it cuts down weeds and ours had died. And so I convinced my parents to let me take apart the broken weed eater. And I took it down to the motor and I was like, dad, can I hook up just this motor? And he was like, oh, we'll figure out how to do this. So it was super dangerous. And he propped it up on a couple uh, bricks. And from across the garage, we plugged in this bare motor and um, it spun up and started skittering all around the garage until it managed to uh, rock the wires loose. I mean, those moments of taking things apart and, and using something unin for its unintended purpose it, are those those really valuable moments. So I encourage you to yeah, find an old printer, find an old piece of junk and take it apart with your students. And maybe you talk about what's inside. Maybe you don't even need to identify the technical bits, but it, 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 I, I encourage folks to learn that technology is not magical that there's just, there's, there's parts inside and we can talk about how those parts work together. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit, Andres is asking, uh, some of the more surprising or unanticipated use of your products you've come across? Uh, so there was, um, God, a long time ago, we um, built an IMU. And an IMU is a thing that measures direction and speed and different things. And um, this was a long time ago, 10 years ago. Uh, this guy walks in and he's a normal looking nerd. And the guy behind him is this cowboy in a cowboy hat and he is walking weird and limping, right? And it's just like, who, what is this? And uh, the cowboy was a professional bull rider. And what they were doing, it was the same. Do you guys remember um, the hockey thing when you hit the hockey puck and it would overlay this, it would go red whenever the hockey puck went a certain speed? It was on ESPN for like a year and it drove the viewers crazy. Um, but that same technology, they were trying to overlay onto professional bull riding. Huh. So how hard the bull is jumping, they wanted to show in real time in, on a live rodeo what the rider was experiencing. Wow. Um, a follow on from Andres as well, uh, wanted to know if any, if you ever come across uh, applications of your products that you actually didn't approve of. Oh, absolutely. So it's um, uh, uh, Bluetooth gas pump skimmers are, are like the, the STD of North America. So um, Bluetooth gas pump skimmers, um, when you go to a gas pump in North America and you, you, you swipe your credit card and then you get your gas and go on your way. Um, well, there's like uh, four manufacturers of gas pumps in the world and they share two keys. And so if you have those two keys, you can open up any gas pump anywhere. 
So what the criminals are doing is they open up the gas pumps, they stick in um, a data logger and a Bluetooth module, and then they close everything up. And then it just sits there logging all the credit card numbers that go by. And then when the perpetrator comes back and uses Bluetooth, they can download all of that data. And so, yeah, um, credit card skimmers are this like big problem. And of course, on all of the photographs, the you know, big, scary, blurry people holding up these things. And the only thing you can see in focus is sparkfun.com, right? And it's just like, oh, great. Okay. So um, yes, all of our products can be used for very good and educational purposes. And all of our products can be used for very bad things. Um, so we have been working closely with the Department of Justice and uh, God, the Secret Service and the FBI, um, helping them sort of analyze and look at um, Bluetooth skimmers and how to create infrastructure so that they are less um, used. So Nathan, how do you pay for gas? <laughs> With a chip card. Okay, got it, got it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so um, uh, Donna asks, when is the next SparkFun dumpster dive? And maybe what is a SparkFun dumpster uh, dive? Is, is we, another question. Yay, the SparkFun Nation is here. Uh, the dumpster dive. So um, uh, years ago, it was like, hey, you know, running warehouse and doing electronics, you, you end up with um, bad stuff, broken boards. And it's just like, you know, we can't use this, but I hate to throw it away. Um, here's these capacitors that we're not going to use. Here are these assemblies that we put together. And we, you know, we, uh, we manufacture like 40,000 40, boards a month. Of those 40,000, a tiny little fraction don't work. But that tiny little fraction is still like 100 or 200 boards. So what do you do with that? So we said, you know what? Maybe our customers could use this. And so we would um, gather all the stuff from the previous six months, and then we would dole it out by weight. And then we have the dumpster dive where it is a product that just goes on sale. And I think the it, it sold out in like six minutes. It's insane how fast these boxes of non-functional stuff get sold to our customers. So to answer your question, the next dumpster dive, I have no idea what it is, but we have a lot of fun stuff that are gonna go in it. Um, so definitely keep an eye out on the newsletter and the website uh, at sparkfun.com and um, the next dumpster dive will make you very aware of it. So Amy wants to know, um, how would someone ensure safety on open source pharmaceuticals? We have had multiple talks. The Open Source Hardware Administration, um, ha, and, and I'm part of the Open Source Hardware uh, uh, Association, have had multiple talks and meetings at the White House under the Obama administration, including talks with the FDA. And so how do you guarantee, the, the FDA is very open to this because they want to get ahead of it. Um, they know that there's a lot of uh, open source, um, forgive me, um, what do you call that, like uh, fake arms and legs? Um, prosthetics, open source prosthetics. So folks building their own prosthetics. Now, what you asked about was open source pharmaceuticals. The, uh, I don't know. Um, there, there's a lot of sort of user beware. Um, there are folks that you know built their own. Uh, what was that? COVID vaccine. They they manufactured their own COVID vaccine, and it was like 500 bucks, but they were able to do it. So it's that level of innovation is very interesting to me. But I don't yet know how to. Um, navigate the science. That said, that is science. That is, you know, doing research and publishing and sharing your results with the world. So as long as it can be done in a safe and scientific manner, um, I think we could have open source pharmaceuticals. So uh, Tim is asking, uh, effectively, I'm, I'm truncating this question a little bit, Tim, but I, basically, like, how do you uh, balance, you know, better evaluation of the dangers of innovation versus innovation itself. Like you, you seem to be really emphasizing the value of the speed of innovation, but are there, are there areas where you feel like you really need ethically uh, to pause for a minute and, and think about uh, dangers and in innovation? So this is the Oppenheimer question, right? The, the nuclear genie in a bottle, should we or should we not? Um, you know, I, uh, I, yeah, I, do believe in technology and innovation. And anytime you try to filter that or censor that, the unintended consequences are often much worse than the unfettered sort of innovation. That said, there's ecological um, uh, uh, damage and all sorts of stuff. So I do believe in regulation, but um, I don't believe in, you know, stopping technological advances um, 
because you know the unintended the law of unintended consequences i just don't know i would uh i think it's better to be very transparent and upfront with the world so let's use artificial intelligence for example you know we need a uh, 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 large groups of very smart people debating this you do not want one company deciding uh what they should do with their technology and their customers this should be very transparent and a, and a large conversation with a lot of smarter people than me um, about what we should do with this technology um, but the second that you try to like have a company make that decision or the second you try to filter or hold back um it, i think things go bad so i guess is is the answer then that and it sounds like this is what Spark Street is doing, but is, is the answer then you're saying not to necessarily be protective of the IP, but just have such a great quality product that uh, people will buy it even though there are other products out there? Is that, that's pretty much the heart of it? Um, you, it goes down to the, the business, uh, uh, the, the business problem. Yeah. The, you, you have such a great product. You're, you may be the only ones that have it. If you're really, really fast, you're the first ones to market with it. If you're not really fast, maybe you're the second or third ones, uh, to market with it. Wikipedia was the 11th attempt at an online, uh, encyclopedia. Um, so you don't have to be first to market with your idea. Um, but Wikipedia was, is still standing. So there's a whole case studies around why they were the ones that stuck. Um, we think we are successful because our products have, you know, the best, the best quality, the best support, uh, the best value overall. Um, now that's the, the business model, but from an internal perspective, open source is super valuable because it makes me more money because it forces us to innovate. It never allows us to let us sit on our laurels. Hmm. So um, Lawrence uh, is, did end up rephrasing the question. And I think, I think we're, we're getting more to what he wanted to, uh, to ask, which is, he said, I was talking about intellectual property and individuals who make their living creating it like authors and musicians. If you take their hard work and resell it, they will have no way to afford making their living creatively. Open source doesn't work in that world. I think this is the touches a little bit on our like what if what if Mickey Mouse didn't have a copyright like do you I mean so how do you how do you apply that methodology do you think this is just like a different sphere and we should not be thinking about it or or how do you deal with that intellectual property? The, the, the uh, best example counter example that I can think of um, is uh, the adult film industry. Hmm. So there's absolutely no protection for those performers. And they have had to figure out how to, you know, continue to make money, even though their videos are a commodity. They have no recourse. They can't sue somebody because they are because their videos are going up somewhere else. And they still survive, right? They are. They have gotten creative. They have gotten savvy. And uh, I don't know all the specifics. The article I read had something to do with, you know, it's now personalization. It's all about doing other things. So. I, you know, it's not a poisonous pill, this open source thing. You don't have to throw out trademark and intellectual property. I'm, I'm not saying that your jobs are going to be gone tomorrow, but I am saying that it is possible to be a creative creator, whatever it is that you create in an open source world and make money at it. So uh, Amira and Lawrence are both asking the question about open source and CRISPR, like designer yeah. babies. What, yeah. what, any thoughts there? <laughs> Uh, 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 designer babies is one thing, but CRISPR is like, yeah, totally rocking the world. Um, so the, the future of DNA and uh, genetic modification, we have the tools. Um, it is, it is pretty scary. The level at which, you know, there are YouTube videos showing you how to cut and splice DNA in your garage. Um, so yeah, that, I don't know if we'll ever get to the level of like biohacking and bioterrorism. But um, yeah, we could do, uh, I, I don't want to go down that, that dark hole. <laughs> it's possible. Um, and so uh, Bob is asking if, uh, if you would ever sue someone who stole your best idea. Uh, no, I would buy it from them, <laughs> right? If, if we're not the best at it, I don't make USB cables here. I don't make software defined radios here, right? I could but it's way better to buy those things from the experts. So if somebody took my idea and made it better, cheaper, faster, then yeah, I'll buy from them and I'll go design something else. Um, so we got another one. Uh, what do you think are the most interesting opportunities for hardware hobbyist innovators related to space tech? Oh, um, the, 
I think what was uh, the Mars lander? It was Ingenuity. I forget. Ingenuity was the lander, and then the helicopter had a different name. Anyways, um, we sold the infrared lidar that flew on that helicopter on Mars to JPL. So we had a very, very, very tiny part, but we had stuff on Mars. That's insane. And, and the, if you read the article about why JPL decided to buy that component from us, they said, you know, it's off the shelf, off the shelf, off the shelf stuff works in space as long as you categorize it. So the answer to your question, what hard work can go into space? Anything can go into space. There's so many CubeSats and NanoSats going up right now using off the shelf components, it's, it's pretty staggering. So I would say um, build a lot of them because you're going to need redundancy and some of them are going to fail. But um, you can, yeah, um, we've, we've got all sorts of stuff on the uh, International Space Station. Uh, so what do you think of NFTs? Yeah. Uh, well, actually, maybe explain briefly your understanding of, of an NFT just in case we have audience members who don't know. Non-fungible token. You can take a thing, you can do some cryptographic magic to it, and uh, you can say that this is the one and only digital representation of a thing. And um, I am, I definitely do not invest in cryptocurrencies. I do not invest in NFTs. Um, it, you know, cool, fine. People have extra money and they're doing wacky investments, have at it. Um, but uh, no, I didn't, I got nothing with NFTs. Um, okay, so we just got another question in. What do you think is, uh, has been one of your more successful failures? Oh, uh, okay. So there was this um, game that we came up with. It was called, uh, it was called The Harp and it was a, a hardware alternate reality puzzle. So it was this little circuit board that you got and it came in a special envelope and you paid, I don't know, 40 bucks for it. And you hook it up to your computer and it doesn't work. And what it was is it was basically like an, an escape room in circuits. And so you had to figure out piecing together all the different clues and, and it involved, you know, modifying the board as well as doing some software to make everything work. Um, we thought we were so innovative. What we didn't realize is that we are circuit nerds and not game designers. And, you know, the folks at Steam and EA know exactly what they're doing whenever they make a really good game. And so uh, it was a wonderful experience building that game, but it uh, it sold terribly. It was a terrible <laughs> waste of time. Yeah, in, in terms of dollars, it was tremendously fun, but um, yeah, we didn't, it, we just wasted a bunch of money. You've been answering questions so quickly. I think we have time for one more before Andrew rejoins us. Uh, how do you align your business? Oh, Kate Anthony asks, how do you align your business with global warming and climate change? Um, a few things. We have our own green initiatives here at SparkFun. I'm sitting underneath 300 kilowatt of solar. Um, uh, there's a, a lot of, uh, we have a tremendous number of people in the building that uh, do a lot with um, hard to recycle plastics. So we're doing everything we can to lighten our footprint. That said, we ship a lot of, you know, little bits in the world going all over the planet. Um, I hope that net, we are helping the earth, not hurting the earth. We enable the academics and the researchers and the scientists in this world to, to build better tools and better science behind those tools. Um, first and foremost, oh, I, uh, we, we had the high precision GPS on uh, glaciers in the North Yukon. So, you know, figuring out where the glaciers are moving and doing different stuff. So um, yeah, I, I hope we are uh, uh, treading as lightly as possible. So I want to thank everybody for terrific questions. Uh, welcome back, Anne. Uh, Nathan, we'll see, some of us will see you in the uh, live video q and I also want to say hi to my mom and dad who are actually here in person today. Yes. I was going to say, are you waving at them physically? I mean, can they no, see you? No, they're in the next room, but I don't know. I think <laughs> I, I probably I just embarrassed my mother, which is great. <laughs> your job. It's your job as a son. I have a son. He thinks that's his job. <laughs> thank you so much, Nathan. We're going to let you run over to the other Zoom room, and we're going to thank all of our audience members for being here, asking such good questions. We do have another event queued up for October 19th, and that one is called the Mysteries of Havana Syndrome. We actually convened a committee um, I think it was late last year, the, the um, federal government came to us to ask us about the science of what we knew and what we didn't know about Havana syndrome. So we have David Relman, who was the chair of that committee, who will be joining us with executive producer and writer David Gray. And so it should be a really interesting conversation. Um, we'll see how much we can coax out of David Relman. He knows more than he's saying, that's for sure. <laughs> All right, so we'll see, we'll see you next week and thank you for being here or Thanks, October everybody. 19th. Talk soon.